2020 has been one heck of a year so far. And we still have a presidential election and a Supreme Court nominee ahead of us. During the Wuhan virus lockdown, many faithful Catholics have found their way into the traditional Latin Mass community for the first time. For some who have, no, have longer tenure in the TLM community, this debate has been settled long ago in your minds. You've already arrived at an opinion one way or the other. You may be asking yourself, the 1980s called and they want their canonical uh, crisis back. But for those who are new to tradition, for those who've come in in the last several years, this is a very pressing and relevant issue today. Is the Society of St. Pius X in schism with Rome? The Society of St. Pius X is an international priestly fraternity founded in 1970 by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. He was a traditionalist French prelate who participated in the Second Vatican Council and afterwards helped Cardinal Odoviani compose what was later called the Odoviani Intervention. A missionary for much of his priesthood, Archbishop Lefebvre was committed to the traditional liturgies and disciplines of the church, even after the council. The relationship between the Holy See and the Society of St. Pius X deteriorated in the 1980s. And in 1988, against the express permission of Rome, in fact, they, for, they, they asked him not to do this, they forbade him to do it, Archbishop Lefebvre consecrated four bishops to ensure the continuation of the, of the society after his death. For this, Archbishop Lefebvre was excommunicated by the Pope. The excommunication of the four bishops that he consecrated, however, was lifted by Pope Benedict XVI in 2009. I'll note here that Restoring the Faith has never talked about the Society of St. Pius X. I've never taken a position on it, never opined about it. I've never let you know how I feel about it. And I don't plan to do that tonight or even after this event. But I am very happy that this discussion is happening because I hope that it will be entertaining, enlightening, and engaging. Today, we're lucky to be joined by David Gordon, who will be arguing that the society is, in fact, in schism with Rome. David is a Catholic apologist, writer, and podcaster. He holds degrees in law, theology, and political science. A husband and father of five, he lives with his family in the Detroit area. This is David's first appearance on RTF, and we're grateful to have him. Welcome, David. On the other side, we've got Jeff, Jeff Kassman, who will argue that the society is, in fact, not in schism. You've seen Jeff on the channel before when he debated against distributism just last month. Jeff continues his tenure at Kassman Enterprises with 14 direct reports, not including his chief of staff, Mrs. Kassman. Jeff joins us from the Nashville area. Welcome back, Jeff. The rules of engagement are as follows. I will not be playing the role of Chris Wallace tonight. Neither of these gentlemen will be debating me. So neither, uh, however, what will happen is David is going to have 10 minutes of uninterrupted time, truly uninterrupted, I suspect, to lay out his initial case. Jeff will then follow up with 10 minutes to rejoin what David has presented. We will then have five rounds of five minutes apiece going back and forth. Now, because we are live streaming today, and the reason why we're live streaming is so that this can be interactive. So I'd really like to take your questions and your comments and interject them into the debate. Uh, that Please do me a favor, like and share the video so that the Russian bots at YouTube will present this to as many people as possible. They definitely don't want us doing what we're doing tonight. And then finally, um, this is a lot of work, especially as a hobby. My wife and family sacrifice a lot so that I can do this. Could you subscribe to the channel? Uh, I would really appreciate it if you could. Without further ado, I would like to turn it over to David for his 10-minute opening. Sure. Thanks so much, and thanks for having me on the channel. Thank you for hosting the debate. It takes um, kind of a brave heart in today's fickle society where a lot of people shy away from controversy and debate and really hashing things out among brothers. It takes uh, some sand to actually do that and to have your channel be involved in in the hosting of a topic that's surely um, going to raise some hackles. But that's that's not our intention here today. Be assured uh, that I come here really as an ally, as a fellow Christian. And my point is not to set myself apart from SSPX as an enemy. 
to, to come here and scold. I actually want to do this debate because this has been something that's been not receiving enough attention in the last 10 or 15 years uh, for a couple reasons. And I'm going to get into that. But it seems like traditional Catholic apologists and podcasters have been avoiding the issue. And it's a serious issue because it's truly the life of souls at stake. It's people's eternal destinies at stake because apart from Rome, outside the bark of Peter, there is no salvation. And that's something that traditional Catholics will say ad nauseum, but then they don't understand that that has to do with the primacy of the Holy See, the primacy of the Pope and adherence to the magisterium, both extraordinary and ordinary. So I come here not as an enemy. And I think people, because I've addressed this rather straightforwardly in the past um, on rules for retrogrades, I feel like people have painted me as an enemy of the society. And maybe that's because it's easier to write somebody off as an enemy than it is to engage substantively with their points. And you'll see this a lot even with the LDS church, the Mormons, instead of engaging and saying, okay, this is why these traditional Christian apologists who are saying that, you know, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, they have these errors in them, their leaders tell them just to assume we're coming at it from an anti-Mormon point of view, and we're not. Uh, we're coming at it from a truth-only point of view. As disciples of Christ, the Great Commission applies to us universally, and this is something I just wrote on, on Church Militant. I wrote a commentary piece about it. Uh, we have to go and preach the gospel, and that means preaching the good news to everybody, and it means um, particularly calling people to repentance where they've erred. Now, to dissociate yourself from the church, and that's what I intend to prove tonight, is that the SSPX have wittingly or unwittingly, wittingly I would say on the part of their leadership, and unwittingly on the part of so many that attend their chapels, have dissociated themselves from the church and their eternal salvation is at risk. Um, so I come here to call you to repentance and to, to have you hear me out as a brother in Christ, not as an enemy, not as somebody who has some vendetta against the SSPX, God knows I agree with many of the points they raise, but truly the issue is one partly of procedure and partly of substance, because even if there are substantive issues that you think you're correct on, you still have to do things procedurally correctly in the church. And that means not withdrawing yourself from communion with the faithful or with the Pope. And that's what's happened, alas. Um, so, there's a battle going on in the hearts and minds of many traditionalists. That's one of the reasons why you haven't heard the SSPX called out by many of the kind of punditry on just the Catholic right, on of Orthodox Catholics, because we do love the TLM. We do love traditional liturgy. We do believe that the ecumenia in the wake of the Second Vatican Council has gone too far. We do cringe and cry out when we see the liturgical abuses that were so rampant in the post-conciliar age. So the fact is that when you have a bishop like Lefebvre that comes along and who is willing to go to the mat for traditional Catholicism, for the faith of our fathers, that's refreshing. And you tend to see him as an ally. Um, and so there's a bit of this feeling of being loath to criticize Lefebvre on the part of people on just the Orthodox Catholic right who, who want to stand up for the faith. But there's a little bit of a more pernicious reason, and I feel like because of the zealousness, and I don't mean that as a backhanded compliment, but because of the zealousness of many of the SSPX adherents, many of those who attend their chapels for the faith, then people are really reticent to alienate them by making good faith critiques of SSPX talking points and SSPX uh, theology, for lack of a better word, because they know that will cost them clicks on their channel. It's going to cost them support. It's going to cost them financially because people who are more zealous are more apt to donate and give money and give funds to groups that are in harmony with their worldview. And see, I, I hope, even if you disagree fervently with what I have to say tonight, 
that you can at least respect that I'm coming to you as a brother. And I'm not worried about my wallet. I'm not worried about my public reputation. I'm going to speak to you the truth. I'm not going to patronize you. I'm going to um, just say what it is that the church teaches and why canon law is that it is and why church doctrine is what it is and why the church has taken the steps that she's taken in response to the Lefebvreist controversy. So that's why I'm here tonight. It's because it's actually an act of filial love to you all. And just like John Paul II wrote to um, Archbishop Lefebvre when he counseled him not to do this thing, not to go through with the illicit Econe consecrations. Um, so I guess the one other thing I want to mention, I'm, I'm already running up against the clock. I'm sorry. Uh, let's. You, we've all heard this prophecy, this verse of scripture, that in the end times, if Christ doesn't come and shorten the tribulation, then he's, he's not going to have any faithful left. And for a long time, that's vexed me. Because it seems like I know a lot of people who are really staunch in their faith, who are orthodox to the bone, who would die for their faith. So how can it be that so few people would, would remain faithful in the end times and when we're in a tribulation period? And it, what, what I've stumbled on is that the devil, when he undermines the magisterium and makes them fall away and gives us bad shepherds, it, it's a double-edged sword. He drives people out of the church from the left, and he drives people out of the church from the right. He drives people out of the church from the left because when bishops fail to uphold their the teaching aspect of their magisterium, right, there's three uh, what are traditionally called munra of the magisterium, which is teaching, sanctifying, and governing, uh, teaching and giving the sacraments, and then actually doing the governing role of, of Peter. Um, when, when they fail to do their teaching role, then people have bad catechesis, and since the intellect shapes the will, then they, people fall away from the church, just from bad catechesis and falling into error. But on the other hand, when they fail to uphold their duty, when they fail to do their sanctifying role and their teaching role, then people are so hungry for the truth that they wander away to the fables of anyone who, like, postures themselves or who holds themselves out to be a staunch proponent of the faith and a staunch apologist for the faith. So even though you have some people who might be saying things that are in lockstep or mostly in lockstep with Catholic doctrine and dogma, if they're doing things wrong, they can still draw you out of the church. And we, that's what I think we're seeing now. There's such a hunger to be fed on the part of the sheep, on the part of the people, that they'll wander away when they're called away by these other, um, by, I'm sorry, that was right in my, uh, it's two minutes, sorry. Um, they will wander away to traditionalist teachers who are teaching most of the faith, but not all the faith, and who are doing it in an illicit and incomplete way and out of communion with Rome. So there's a twofold danger, and that's how the devil is right now, I believe, sifting the church like wheat. Now, I need to move on because apparently I've already spent eight minutes. Um, the real issue right now, and there's a lot of stuff out there, there's a lot of weeds to fall into, to get into on this topic. The real issue, what needs to be adjudicated, is whether the SSPX is in schism. Because outside the church, there is no salvation. If they're in schism, they must be avoided. If they're not in schism, then you can go and be in communion with the SSPX, because that means they're in communion with the church. But if they're in schism, no good can come out of it because there is no salvation outside of the church. So, what is schism then? We have to define our terms. That's fundamental when you're talking um, philosophy or theology. You have to define your terms. So here's Thomas Aquinas' definition of a schismatic. Now, a schismatic commits a twofold sin. First, by separating himself from communion with members of the church, and in this respect, the fitting punishment for schismatics is that they be excommunicated. Secondly, they refuse submission to the head of the church. Therefore, they are unwilling to be controlled by the church's spiritual power. Uh, he goes on um, later in the Summa. The essence of schism consists in rebelliously disobeying the commandments of the church. And I say rebelliously, since a schismatic both obstinately scorns the commandments of the church and refuses to submit to her judgment. But every sinner does not do this. Wherefore, not every sin is a schism. Um, and then Aquinas later says, 
he quotes Jerome, at the outset, it is possible in a certain respect to find a difference between schism and heresy. Yet there is no schism that does not devise some heresy for itself, that it may appear to have had a reason for separating from the church. Um, also, so what we're seeing here is just the church's tradition um, is that there's this two elements of schism. One is heresy and one is disobedience. And when you combine heresy and grave disobedience, what you have is schism. Not a reactive disobedience is a schismatic act. Um, can I... Would uh, my interlocutor yield me a couple of minutes here, and I'd be happy to return the favor, Jeff, or let him have a couple extra minutes? I'm sorry I rambled at the beginning. Sure, go ahead, Dick. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. I just, I, I didn't even have the beginning of a cogent argument yet. <laughs> Keep going. Um, <laughs> okay, thanks. Let's see. So, in keeping with that, with that tradition, and that's backed up by you look in the Catholic Encyclopedia and um, St. Jerome elsewhere upholds this, this idea of what is schism. Um, canon 751 of the 1983 Code of Canon Law really codifies this, uh, well, literally codifies it. It defines schism as, quote, the withdrawal of submission to the Supreme Pontiff or from communion with the members of the church subject to him. So that is going to be my working definition of schism, and I'm sure maybe Jeff will have something to say about that. I'm actually not sure where the SSPX would fall on the definition of schism. Um, so that said, what we have here with the Ikone consecrations, the consecrations of the four bishops in Switzerland by Lefebvre in 1988, I believe July 6th, is... Or was it June 30th? Sorry. Um, I think it's June 30th. The, the, what we have here is an act of disobedience that is predicated fundamentally on doctrinal error. And you'll see that Pope Benedict has said that the, what is separating the SSPX from the faithful are primarily doctrinal in nature. Uh, he says the problems to be addressed between the church and the SSPX are essentially doctrinal in nature and concern primarily the acceptance of the Second Vatican Council and the post-conciliar magisterium of the popes. So the separation, what led to the separation between the SSPX and the church is an act of disobedience, the illicit consecration of the four bishops in Switzerland, and that's something I, I believe we have common ground. We'll both agree, or I don't want to put words in Jeff's mouth, but I would assume he would agree that the consecrations undertaken were against the express um, directives of the church. And, I mean, I, I, I can prove that. Um, but what it, it's predicated on a doctrinal disagreement. And that is why, that, that's the basic reason for why they're in schism. I have more, I'm sure I can go on to, to more in my rebuttal, but let me, let me rest there because I've already taken up too much time. All right, thank you so much for your comments, David. Uh, Jeff, you heard a lot uh, come out of uh, Dave's mouth uh, and, and, and the argument. He said that Orthodox Catholics really oppose some of the modernist stuff that we see. They, they cringe alongside of the traditionalists. Uh, he said that outside the church there is no salvation, that's de fide dogma of the church, and he says specifically that the act of consecrating those four bishops was a schismatic act that has rendered the society into schism. Your 10-minute rebuttal, sir. Thank you, Mike. I uh, appreciate you hosting this debate, and ladies and gentlemen, my debate opponent here, he's a man just like you and I. He's not a canon lawyer, he's not a cleric speaking with any canonical authority. He does not sit on a church tribunal uh, of the first or the second instance. He's not a member of the Roman Rota. He does not possess the authority to declare other Catholics to be excommunicated or in schism. And we Catholics live in a, a, a church, the living body of Christ, and it is ordered properly to authority. So he can share with us his opinions, and he can support those opinions potentially uh, with authoritative citations. But whether it's proper or prudent for him to do so, giving his lack of standing or his lack of credentials to rule on this is another matter. Now, I will admit uh, that my debate opponent tonight is a well-educated, intelligent man. I listened to an hour and 45 minutes of his uh, explanations about why he believes the SSPX is in schism. 
Uh, but I'm going to tell you that having listened to that and tracked down all of the citations personally, he cites people who either themselves lack the authority to make such claims, or he cites people whose declarations are directly contrary to the church's law, or he cites people whose rulings have actually been reversed by their successors or a higher authority. And in some cases, some of the citations are fit into all three categories. So I think it's a dubious claim. I'm going to jump right into the relevant issues, starting at the beginning in 1988 that David has already referenced. Lefebvre and the four other bishops were declared uh, to have incurred a late sententiae ex excommunication. Now, JP2 did not declare a ferende sententiae excommunication, and there's an important difference under the law. A ferende sententiae excommunication is a, a public direct uh, declaration of excommunication by a competent authority. JP2 chose not to do that. He could have, he chose not to. Why did he claim that Lefebvre had done it to himself rather than just saying without any question that he was saying it by his own authority? Well, if you talk to canon lawyers about this, you'll find out something that's very interesting. A plain reading of canon law will lead you to conclude that Lefebvre never really was excommunicated. Let's take a look at it. Canon 1323, part four. A person who acted coerced by grave fear, even if only relatively grave, or due to necessity or grave inconvenience, unless the act is itself intrinsically evil or tends to the harm of souls. Now think of this like recognizing that we have speed limits that govern how fast we drive, but you can uh, exceed the speed limit out of necessity. Like, for example, you're driving to the hospital and you have a grave matter. Now, David will tell you that there was no necessity and that if there had been, JP2 of all people would have known that and would have been able to decide. But of course, popes aren't perfect and JP2 was himself not a canon lawyer and we can look to his pontificate. It was a long one and it was a sad one with some of the greatest abuses in the history of the church, not only occurring under his reign, but being tolerated and even promoted. We're talking about thousands of clerics and bishops and cardinals promoted by the Pope, who we now know were terrible, horrific men, not just sexual abuse, but the graver crimes of constant public liturgical abuse and abuses on our, own, our Lord's own body, Eucharistic abuses, actively, publicly promoted. It's impossible to say that he didn't know what was going on. So given his lack of judgment, given a long track record of poor judgment when it comes to the governance of the church, we cannot possibly credibly claim that JP2 knew the mind of Archbishop Lefebvre better than Lefebvre knew himself. And if you disagree with that, we could start with a conversation about Father Maciel. And we could end that conversation with a conversation about Cardinal McCarrick. That's probably a topic for a different time. But I'll, I'm willing to play devil's advocate. Perhaps it's more appropriate to even say for, for this, the sake of this conversation, David, I'll play the advocate for church militant and claim that in the 1980s, there was no crisis in the church. Imagine that. Imagine in 2020 to say there is no crisis and there never was a crisis in the church. There was no necessity to preserve the traditional sacraments or the traditional priesthood. Well, let's say that was really what you believed. It doesn't matter because if you look to part seven of that same canon that I already cited, it says it doesn't matter if there really is a necessity. It only matters if the person who is about to incur the penalty actually thinks there's necessity. Canon 1323, a person who without negligence thought that one of the circumstances mentioned previously was present. Now to continue my analogy from beginning, you exceed the speed limit on the way to the hospital, you think your baby is dying, guess what? He wasn't really dying, he was just unconscious, but you thought he was. You're not really guilty of the crime that you would otherwise be guilty of. And all Catholics with a decent formation know that this is true, because intention matters when we're talking about the culpability for serious sins. Now, if you've been following along, you know I'm just a layman, a sinful one at that. Some people have called me a dilettante and even worse. So don't trust me. I'm not telling you these things on my own authority. I'm also not accusing other people of schism or excommunication. But what if I told you that this very same argument I've just shared with you has been approved of at the church's most prestigious canon law universities. For example, Father Gerald Murray, who is by no means a traditionalist, was studying for his license 
in canon law and his doctorate in canon law at Gregorian University in Rome, a university that I believe the Gordon family is familiar with. He advanced this exact same argument in his doctoral thesis. He earned his doctoral thesis and his license to practice canon law on the back of this exact same argument. Now, by the way, the irony in all of this is that in the old canon law in 1917, the mind of the archbishop would not have mattered. But in JP2's own code promulgated in 1983, this exception to the code was inserted. It's almost like the Holy Ghost worked through the Holy Father, through that canonical commission drafting the new law to protect tradition without anyone realizing it at the time. Now, let's talk about schism. Schism can be material and it can be formal. Material schism is a state of separation. You did it, it's happened. Formal schism is one that results from a declaration by a competent authority. It's like when you you exceed the speed limit, you're actually already guilty, and it only becomes formal later when the judge declares it. But in Canon 1382, which refers to that late sententiae excommunication, we've already shown that they were null by the very direct reading of the canon law itself. And by the way, there's no mention in the canon law that, that Episcopal concentrations are uh, illicit Episcopal cons uh, consecrations are by themselves schismatic acts. That doesn't exist. So in fact, the authorities on this subject, canon lawyers, bishops, the CDF, that's the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, Faith and the popes themselves have repeatedly and explicitly said that these were not the beginning of a schism. For example, in 2005, Cardinal Dario Castrillon Hoyos, president of the Pontifical Commission for Ecclesia Dei, stated unequivocally that the SSPX was not in schism. And 13 years later, his successor, Archbishop Pozo, also again stated explicitly that the SSPX was not schismatic and that the members were not excommunicated. Now, you may remember that the Pontifical Commission for Ecclesia Dei was the church commission tasked for all of the dealings with the SSPX and all of the other Latin mass apostolates that would come from them. So this is the head of that commission making it explicitly clear, appointed at the time by Cardinal Ratzinger, who of course later became Pope. So this issue of the Pontifical Commission declaring that the SSPX was not in schism raises another really interesting point. If you're Catholic, if you respect the authority of the church that God created himself to get us to heaven, before the Pontifical Commission was dissolved, it operated under the jurisdiction of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Now, this commission, again established in 1988, was designed to promote and define the doctrine of the faith and the traditions of the faith in the Catholic world. Now, since that time, this is the commission that has exclusively dealt with the SSPX. If the people in the Vatican, if the Holy Father himself, believed that the SSPX was not Catholic, not in communion with Rome, or in schism, then it would not be the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith that they would be talking to. It would be the Pontifical Council for the Interreligious Dialogue that would manage relationships with the SSPX, just like they do truly schismatic people in the Orthodox, or the Old Catholics, or those in schism, like the Presbyterians, the Anglicans, the Lutherans. But they're not in schism. And for 38 years now, the Vatican has not treated them as though they were in schism. Now, you might say Rome is trying to be nice. You might even say it's just a euphemism. But once we start to say that the words that the Vatican uses, the words that the Pope use, are no longer to be taken for what they normally mean, for what they, their plain reading is, and that everything is simply a, a euphemistic approach to things, then how would we ever know that they really meant an excommunication? How would we ever know if someone really did say schism, that it was really a schism and not just some sort of euphemistic approach? Now, finally, Pope Francis has repeatedly stated that the SSPX is Catholic. He believed that the SSPX was Catholic when he worked directly with them as the Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires. He has continued that today under his own pontificate. So I'm willing to say at this point that given the facts, given that the Holy Father has been explicit, given that my interlocutor has no authority to pontificate on these matters, that there's a substantial burden that David needs to climb and, and meet in order to make his case. Thank you, Mike.
David, you're going to have five minutes uh, to respond. Thank you so much, Jeff, for your comments. Um, you heard Jeff uh, cite Canon Law 1324, uh, grave, grave or necessity re reason uh, that the act was not intrinsically evil. He cited the long and painful pontificate of John Paul II, sometimes painful, uh, and his poor judgment. Um, he, he cited that, that, you know, that imagine that there was no state of emergency in the 1980s. He made a distinction between material and formal schism which I think is important, and, and I, I will ask you to address that as well. Um, he mentioned that members of the Ecclesia Dei Commission, the leaders, two in, in a row, did say that the society was not schismatic and that Pope Francis himself from Buenos Aires and ultimately in Rome have, have made these claims. So, um, David, uh, I'll, I'll set the clock for five minutes for you if, um, if you're ready. Sure. It's going to be a, it's gonna be a rush. So... Obviously, at the outset of an argument, since I'm arguing, I'm proposing that there is a change to the status quo, there's this burden shift to me to, uh, to make my point, to, to say, oh yes, the SSPX is in schism. But I'm about to show you is that the magisterium has spoken quite clearly um, and said, yes, they are in schism. So the burden now shifts back because we have what is the magisterium at the very top talking and, and labeling the SSPX explicitly as schismatic on many, many occasions. So given that, there's this burden shifting back where it's now up to them to show why they're not, despite the fact that in the church, which is a monarchy, and having the Pope have made a pronouncement, a solemn pronouncement, that they are in schism through a motu, motu proprio, Ecclesia Dei, which he issued on July 6th of 1988, uh, a few days after the illicit consecrate, of the illicit consecrations, um, it, it's now on them to overcome that. And you can't. Here's the thing. Guys, this is why schisms catch on. Every side has an argument that sounds kind of plausible, especially to laymen. That's one thing. We hear Jeff saying, I'm a layman. I have no expertise. Okay, good. Then you should be a son of the church and defer to the Pope. You should defer to Holy Mother Church. The thing is, the, the reason that schisms catch on and heresies catch on is because they can always appeal to the, to the faithful and who aren't experts, who have no theological training, and say, well, look, I have a nifty canon law argument for you, so you should come over to my point of view. That's why that works. But you have to acknowledge in an act of humility that you have no training in canon law. I don't have training in canon law. Um, I, I took a graduate class on it when, when I was in school for theology, but I'm not a canon lawyer. I'm a lawyer and I have a master's degree in theology. So although I'm not a canon lawyer, I can navigate this with some facility. But the fact is that the church has spoken and you need to listen to Holy Mother Church. That's why God gave us the church in the first place was to keep people on point because he knows we don't have a ton of theologians out there in the pews, nor should we because people have to go and do other things and produce for society. So he gave us a church and part of the trusting spirit that's demanded of us as sons of the church is that we listen to the magisterium and we heed their words. So here on July 1st, 1988, Cardinal Gantin for the congregation for the bishops uh, the, the day after the illicit consecrations wrote to Lefebvre um, saying, notwithstanding the formal canonical warning of June 17th last and the repeated appeals to desist from his intention has performed a schismatic act by the Episcopal consecration of four priests without pontifical mandate and contrary to the will of the Supreme Pontiff, and has therefore incurred the penalty envisaged by Canon 1364, Paragraph 1, and Canon 1382 of the Code of Canon Law. So, let me, he goes on. Having taken account of all the juridical effects, I declare that the above-mentioned Archbishop Lefebvre and Bernard Lefebvre, Bernard Follet, Bernard Tissier de Melleray, Richard Williamson, and Alfonso de Galareta have incurred ipso facto excommunication latte sententiae reserved to the apostolic see. That is a declaration on the part of the church, a recognition of a twofold excommunication, by the way. It's twofold. There's an excommunication for the crime of schism, and there's also an excommunication envisioned by canon law for the crime of consecrating a bishop without papal uh, without a papal mandate. 
So there's a twofold excommunication. And by the way, uh, SXPX, in order to trick people over to their side, in, in order to fool the laity, talks about excommunication like it has anything to do with being in schism. It does not. It's just the punishment for schism. Schism is the crime, and the usual punishment for it is excommunication. I don't even want to talk about excommunication because they have this uh, Michael Davies prefab explanation that's going to navigate you through this labyrinth of canon law that no one on earth, aside from a few erudite elect in canon law schools, would be able to successfully traverse. It doesn't matter. They're trying to confuse you by conflating the crime and the punishment. The crime is schism. And the punishment usually is excommunication, but whether you actually have a proper and valid excommunication has nothing to do with whether you're in the crime of schism. Now, the fact is that the popes have said they're in schism. And here's John Paul II in Ecclesia Dei, which is his motu proprio, where he explicitly addresses Lefebvre's illicit uh, ordinations. And... Um, he says, in and itself, the act of Lefebvre was one of disobedience to the Roman pontiff, pontiff in a very great, grave matter and of supreme importance for the unity of the church, such as is the ordination of bishops, whereby apostolic succession is sacramentally perpetuated. Hence, such disobedience, which implies in practice the rejection of the Roman primacy, constitutes a schismatic act. In performing such an act, Notwithstanding the formal canonical warning sent to them by Cardinal Prefect of the Congregation for the Bishops on the 17th of June last, Monsignor Lefebvre and um, the, I'm sorry, the Bishop Lefebvre and the priest Bernard Lefebvre, uh, Bernard Tissier de Mellorai, Richard Williamson, and Alfonso de Galaretta have incurred the grave penalty of excommunication envisaged by, can, by ecclesiastical law. Um, just let me get out one more sentence. I know I'm up against the clock here, or one more brief paragraph. He goes on to call the act a schism again. It, he says later on in his motu proprio, In the present circumstances, I wish especially to make an appeal, both solemn and heartfelt, paternal and fraternal, to all those who until now have been linked in various ways to the movement of Archbishop Lefebvre, that they may fulfill the grave duty of remaining united to the Vicar of Christ in the unity of the Catholic Church, and of seizing their support in any way for that movement. Everyone should be aware that formal adherence to the schism is a grave offense against God and carries the penalty of excommunication decreed by the church's law. So the Pope here is calling the SSPX leaders, he's saying their mindset and what they are is in schism. They've committed the crime of schism. And now he's speaking to the faithful and he's saying you cannot go along with their mindset. You may not fall into this trap of schism to which they're leading you. And the minute you adopt their mindset, you yourself are excommunicated. That's what John Paul II is saying here. Now, nothing, it, it, there's many more statements by the church. Um, Cardinal Burke has said they're in schism. Cardinal Mueller has said they're in schism. Obviously, Cardinal Burke was the head of the highest court for the church. These people are not to be lightly disregarded. There has been no substantial changes to the canonical situation of the SSPX, despite what the SSPX tells you. They're going to talk about Pope Francis giving them faculties. That doesn't matter. The church has the keys. It has binding and loosing authority. It can give power to whomever it pleases. That's, it has no, it's neither here nor there. The fact is that there is nothing that has changed, and that's why I'm saying the burden now shifts back. Well, I don't want to talk about excommunications. Excommunication is the punishment. And as you know, a court can convict somebody of a crime and say, well, we're going to commute your punishment. It's an act of clemency. So whether somebody is punished has nothing to do whether, with whether or not they are in the midst of an ongoing crime. The burden now shifts back to, to Jeff to say what has changed between um, 1988, when John Paul II said this, the doctrinal issues are the same. There's been no act of obedience or reconciliation on the part of SSPX. So from the time that John Paul II, in a motu proprio, an official act of his pontificate, labeled them in schism as schismatics, what has substantively changed? Not a thing. Everything else is white noise. It's, it's stuff meant to distract you.
and I would yield and I'll, whatever time I took over, please put it on Jeff. <laughs> well, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Dave. So, uh, Jeff, you heard, you heard Dave make an impassioned set of arguments here. Uh, he's making a clear distinction between the crime and the punishment. The crime, as he says, is actually twofold. It's both the schism and consecrating bishops without a mandate. Um, he refers to uh, Cardinal Gantian, uh, calling it a schismatic act in 88. Um, and then he says, you know, quite clearly that neither you nor he nor I are theologians or canon lawyers. And so um, what we ought to do in a situation where there's doubt, at least, is defer to the Pope as laymen. Um, what say you, sir, five minutes? Yeah, I, I told you at the outset, uh, Mike and everyone listening, that David would make uh, three critical errors uh, in his argument, and he's demonstrated them here. Number one, he would cite people who don't have the authority to declare Catholics to be in schism. Number two, he would cite people who were directly contrary to canon law. And we've already seen, I know David doesn't want to talk about the excommunications. If I was arguing his point, I wouldn't want to either. The canon law is very clear. If the punishment wasn't valid, then it certainly raises questions about whether or not the accusation was valid. Uh, and number three, those rulings They've all been reversed by successors or higher authorities. So David ended by asking, what's changed? Well, let's get right to the bottom line. In the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope is the supreme authority. He literally creates canon law. He's the final authority on earth. There is no higher court of appeal. And Pope Francis has repeatedly stated that the SSPX is Catholic. He knows them well. Remember, the SSPX has a large active presence in Buenos Aires. They have a seminary there. Long before he was pope, he was intervening on their behalf with the government of Argentina, declaring them officially to be Catholic. His successor in Buenos Aires, Cardinal Poli, has done the same thing, defending the society and ensuring that they were recognized by the government, not as schismatics, not as Lutherans, not as out of communion, none of these things, but as Catholics. It's inconceivable that the pope's hand-picked successor in Buenos Aires is defying his wishes. Now, you may say, well, that was all before he was the Pope. But let's settle the matter once and for all right now. In 2009, Pope Benedict lifted those excommunications. Even if you believe they were valid, they were lifted without condition. There was no abjuration. There was no uh, you know, response to say, I, I committed a schismatic act and I'm sorry, or I was guilty of her heresy and I, I, I'm sorry. There was none of that. No conditions. Now, if you say that it was merely merciful, how is mercy ever divorced from justice? It cannot be. Catholics believe that without justice, there can be no mercy. So if you say it was merciful and it was contrary to justice, then you have a problem with the Catholic religion. Now, remember that Pope Benedict was there in 1988. He was the head of the CDF. He knew all the relevant issues. If he believed that there was truly a schism, if he believed they were in heresy, what you're saying is that a pope brought people who were actually in schism, actually in heresy, uh, the, the prefect of the CDF, actually admitted those people back into the church without an abjuration of their heresy. He could have required an oath of loyalty, anything, and he did not. After all, he had picked the men to lead the CDF. He had picked the men to lead the Pontifical Commission on Ecclesia Day. He knew there was no heresy. He knew there was no schism. And don't forget that it was his subordinate, Monsignor Camille Pearl of the PCED, who said in 1995 that Catholics could fulfill their obligation, their Sunday obligations at the Society of St. Pius X. Now, we all know that you can't go to a schismatic church and fulfill your Sunday obligation. You can't go to the Lutherans or the Anglicans or the Orthodox to fulfill your Sunday obligations. So are the leading members of the Pontifical Commission telling people to go to schismatic churches to fulfill their Sunday obligations? That's impossible. Now further, uh, Pope Benedict's successor, Pope Francis in 2015, gave Bishop Fillet, the Superior General of the Society at that time, permission to ordain and discipline priests. Now this is a power that's normally reserved to a diocesan ordinary. The next year in 2016, he gave the Society permanent worldwide faculties and in the very next year, in 2017, Francis instructed the bishops of the world to work with the SSPX on all of their marriages to, quote, eliminate any uncertainty regarding the validity of the sacraments. Now, David wants to play all this down and say this is irrelevant. It has nothing to do with anything. 
But the conclusion is that he believes Pope Francis is actually in communion with schismatics. Now, that's an enormous ecclesiological error. So if you look at all of these letters and all of these permissions from Pope Francis, and you want to interpret these things as being meaningless, then you need to read the letters themselves. When the Pope writes to a bishop on a matter of sacramental validity and concludes his letter by saying, this dicastery relies on your cooperation, well, guess what? That's not an option. He's not asking a favor. He's directing them to work on the sacramental validity of these marriages. Now, 40 bishops in the United States have granted blanket permissions to the SSPX priests to witness those marriages. Are those bishops, like the bishops in Nashville, Tennessee, and in Phoenix, Arizona, and in Covington, Kentucky, are those bishops now in communion with schismatic priests of a false church? It's impossible. Impossible that the Holy Father would direct people to commit what are schismatic acts. So the question I have for David, given that the SSPX is operating with the explicit approval of the Bishop of Rome and in communion with dozens, perhaps hundreds of bishops around the world, are you not yourself risking schism by rejecting his authority on this matter? <laughs> okay, is that, am I uh, good to give my rejoinder? I yield you the rest of my time. Okay, so in 2009, Pope Benedict XVI um, reaffirmed, until the doctrinal questions are clarified, the society has no canonical status in the church, and its ministers, even though they've been freed of the ecclesiastical penalty, do not legitimately exercise any ministry in the church. It can't be any more clear. There are still doctrinal questions, the doctrinal questions that were the impetus for the initial break, they have not been resolved since Pope John Paul II labeled them in an official act as Pope in a motu proprio as schismatics who are in schism, who people should avoid going and adopting their schismatic mindsets because that in and of itself yields a late sententiae uh, excommunication. There's been no rebuttal to that. There's been no change of that status quo. We can talk about Pope Francis in his ordinary magisterium as a bishop, not even as a pope, not in an official act as a pope, saying that they're Catholic. But that doesn't matter. That's not enough to overcome an, a motu proprio. There's a pecking order of clerical documents, of magisterial documents. And in that pecking order, the lower doesn't overcome the higher. The ordinary magisterium, the off-the-cuff statement of a bishop in his diocese, surely doesn't overcome a solemn declaration from the pope sitting in Rome. That's a fact, and it's, it's irrefutable. Um, and here's why Pope Benedict says, again, the excommunications, I don't want to get in the weeds. They're neither here nor there. A court... If I killed somebody, a court could adjudicate me guilty of murder and then say, I don't have to serve prison time. That's part of the clemency function that's baked into the court. Now, there should be justice, and I agree. So there was this, uh, Jeff said that it would be a misappropriation of justice if essentially the SSPX were granted this clemency when they're still in this schismatic problematic state when the crime is still ongoing and i agree that's a problem and that's kind of the false mercy that snuck into the vatican now i'm sure you don't like some parts of amoris Laetitia either right and this is the problem talk it's a false mercy to extend to somebody who's living in a irregular union which kind of sounds like a irregular canonical status a nice little euphemism for you know, divorced and remarried, i.e. adultery, or, you know, the irregular canonical status. That sounds like a nice little euphemism for schismatic. Um, it, it's, it's not a good thing for the souls of the SSPX themselves to, to say, okay, we're going to lift the punishment. We're going to lift the excommunication while the crime is still ongoing. Just like it's not a good thing for the divorced and remarried to say, Come on in, get the sacraments, even though you are still living in an irregular union without repentance. That's not a good thing, but that unfortunately has been the trajectory of the Vatican. But I'm not just speculating here. The popes are on record saying why they've given this olive branch to the SSPX. Benedict is on record saying why he lifted the excommunications. We don't have to speculate. I'll read it right now. 
He called it a discreet gesture of mercy towards four bishops ordained, ordained validly but not legitimately. And he goes on to say, the remission of the excommunication has the same aim as that of the punishment. So again, he's upholding um, the, this crime punishment distinction. Namely, to invite the four bishops once more to return. This gesture was possible once the interested parties had expressed their recognition in principle of the Pope and his authority as pastor, albeit with some reservations in the area of obedience to his doctrinal authority, i.e. they don't accept his, they, they have a problem with church doctrine, and to the authority of the council. Um, so here I return to the distinction between individuals and institutions. The remission of the excommunication was a measure taken in the field of ecclesiastical discipline. The individuals were freed from the burden of conscience constituted by the most serious of ecclesiastical penalties. This disciplinary level needs to be distinguished from the doctrinal level. Um, so the fact that the Society of St. Pius X, he goes on, does not possess a canonical status in the church is not in the end based on disciplinary, but on doctrinal reasons. And you realize Pope Paul VI, I think we all agree the Orthodox are in schism. They continue in schism. But Pope Paul VI lifted their excommunication. It was lifted, I believe, in 1965. So it's not the, the smoking gun that SSPX holds it out to be that these excommunications were removed. It does nothing. I think it's a foolhardy move by the Vatican because it actually gives people an excuse to put their souls on the line by going and joining in a false communion with people who are not in communion with the head of the church of with Rome. So um, I'll, I'll say that. I think we could kind of take it one point at a time. You also brought up Pope Francis and allowing them to, to get married or to witness marriages with um, the permission of the local ordinary with the real bishop, with the valid uh, and licit, licitly acting bishop. Yes, Pope Francis has further extended mercies to the SSPX, but it wasn't because of the SSPX. Uh, it wasn't for their sake institutionally. It was for the sake of the faithful, and he said that too. So the Vatican's on record saying why they're extending these mercies. It has nothing to do with the doctrinal issues. Uh, if it did, then you could tell me tonight that you accept Vatican II without reservation. Without reservation. And you can't. Hence, doctrinal issues remain, and you're still celebrating masses validly, but not illicitly. And because the masses are valid, that is why Ecclesia Dei can say, well, you can go and discharge your Sunday obligation by attending these masses, but they also caution if you buy into the actual belief system behind the masses, then you are in schism and your soul is in danger. Now, again, and you referenced one other thing. The, the head of Ecclesia Day has made some off-the-cuff remarks in interviews saying he doesn't believe that, these, um, that the SSPX is in schism. Well, that's not enough to overcome a motu proprio of the Pope saying that they are in schism. And moreover, that... He doesn't, he's got to show his work. Do your work. Do the math. There's a doctrinal problem and there's ongoing disobedience. That is the definition of schism. So I ask you again, what has changed? Okay. Uh, it looks like... Uh looks like we've we've had a couple arguments here and we're and we're really zooming in on a couple issues now uh jeff so you heard you heard dave talk about the pecking order of papal documents and uh specifically a modu proprio um being being uh his his basis for uh defining what schism is he uh he invites you to comment as well on vatican ii and uh, and and basically says that if if you can't, then that's a doctrinal issue, which is part of the definition of schism. Uh, the Orthodox excommunications were lifted. He he quoted uh, Benedict sixteen, lifting the excommunications on the four bishops as ha be having a remission uh, of the same uh, of basically of of doing it so that they would uh, change their ways. Um, so it is a discreet act. Of mercy, um, according to David. Five minutes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Well, so we're we're back to one of the errors that I spoke about at the outset, and that is citing lower authorities or citing 
previous popes as if those popes could be binding on a successor. Now, imagine if the successors of their popes, of previous popes, did not have the same power as their predecessor. We would be talking about vicars of Paul VI and the vicar of, of John Paul II, and that's not what we do. We talk about the vicar of Christ. Our Lord left this power, and the full power of the papacy flows to every single pope. So if we say that a previous pope did one thing and a subsequent pope can't undo that thing, that's, that's a direct heresy that's, that's been condemned, for example, at Vatican I. I would refer you to Pastor, uh, Pastor Eternus. So the successors have the ability to change the canonical rules that were put in place by another pope. So, for example, when we talk about Cardinal Ganton's opinion in 1988, that's irrelevant today because the current pontiff has made his will explicit. The fact that David doesn't like the way in which he's done it is completely irrelevant. Where Cardinal Burke, after he was no longer on the Roman Rota in 2015, gives his own personal opinion, it's completely irrelevant in 2020, given what Pope Francis has done to establish a canonical presence for the Society of St. Pius X. We're not talking about ordinary magisterium that is furthering the deposit of faith. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about canonical laws that the Pope can literally make at will, and they become binding on those people. Now, I'll give you an example of how this is proven to be true. Uh, there's the so-called Hawaii case in 1991, when the bishop in Hawaii excommunicated people who were attending the society mass. He believed the same kind of ideas that David has been expressing about the SSPX. That position was overturned by Cardinal Ratzinger in 1993. He said explicitly that there was not a, a schism and that the people who were attending those masses were not in excommunication, were not schismatic themselves. Now, if it really were a schismatic church, then not only would they not be satisfying their Sunday obligation, they could not give money to the church, uh, and they would, in fact, be excommunicated. And, of course, we know from the authorities that I've already cited that none of that was true. So this desire to go back in time to find some lower authority or some, uh, some predecessor and cite that as the authority while ignoring the authority of the current pontiff, that sounds a lot like set of a contism to me. And I'm uncomfortable with saying that because I don't like Pope Francis or I, I didn't like an encyclical he wrote, that he's in some way bound by his predecessor on a matter of canon law, which he can change at will. Now, uh, Archbishop Schneider has been very eloquent on this matter. And remember, he was chosen by the Pope to go visit the SSPX on a canonically prescribed visit. Doesn't get any more uh, official than this, to seek out a pastoral solution. He says very directly that not only is the SSPX Catholic, that they are holding to the deposit of faith, that there is no schism, there is no heresy. It's right there in his book. I, I, I know that, that David has, has read it. Uh, Bishop Fillet was given power directly by the Pope to ordain priests and to discipline priests. Now, I don't know how many Orthodox priests or bishops have been given the power to ordain and discipline their priests. I don't know how many Lutheran bishops have been named a canonical minister of the first instance. That's where trials are held uh, for clerics. Or Bishop Fillet being named a canonical minister of the second instance. That's like the appellate court for the first. I don't know how many Lutheran or Presbyterian or Anglican bishops David is going to cite that this pope has given that power to. I'm going to guess it's zero. I'm going to guess that that hasn't happened, even though the excommunications of the Orthodox were lifted in 65. I don't know how many of the Orthodox priests were given the right to offer Mass in St. Peter's, as the SSPX have, or how many Roman Catholic bishops in the United States are witnessing those marriages. I'm going to guess it's, it's zero. So these are not off-the-cuff acts. These are direct canonical acts by a valid bishop of Rome. The power rests entirely in him. And, and think about this. How could Bishop Fillet be named a minister of the first instance or a minister of the second instance to judge those priests if those priests don't exist in the eyes of the church? How could it be a canonical minister to nothing? That's impossible. That's not the way the law works. After all, schismatics are beyond the authority of the Pope. Canon law does not apply to them. 
So when the Pope has disciplinary rules, when the Pope says you must give up meat on Friday, you must attend Mass on Sunday, those rules, those canonical rules, don't apply to schismatics. It's a recognition that they're outside the, the temporal authority of the Bishop of Rome. And yet the society mentions the, the Pope in, in their canon. The society prays for the local ordinary at every Mass. The bishops of the society do not uh, you know, create parallel churches. Their chapels are not parishes. Their priests are not pastors. It's clear that the Pope has recognized them as Catholic and give them, given them the canonical standing to have a minister of the church standing there ordaining and disciplining those priests. So, so on this question of the Orthodox, here's my, my question for you, David. How many Orthodox priests have been given faculties, jurisdiction, a canonical ministry in the church, and the right to offer Mass at St. Peter's? Zero. Zero. But it could be a million. Because he's the Pope. And as you've said, no one judges the Pope. The Pope has the keys. He has the keys to the church. He can grant faculties to whomever he pleases, granted that they are in the proper state, i.e. a priest. So just because the, the, the Vatican hasn't done something like this in the past, because the Holy See hasn't done something like this in the past, you're getting an ought from an is. The fact is that he's the Pope, and he can do as he pleases. If he wants to give faculties to the Orthodox, then he can. Now, it wouldn't be right to until those um, problematic doctrinal issues are resolved. And I think it's not right to when it comes to the SSPX either. But I'm not the Vatican. I don't presume to be the Pope. He can do what he wants to whom he wants in terms of his spiritual authority, in terms of his authority to bind and loose. So the fact that they haven't done this with well, the Anglicans don't even have a valid priesthood, but with the Orthodox, that's their business. I don't presume to judge. Now, it's hilarious to me, actually, that the SSPX are telling me, uh, somebody in, in good standing with the church who recognizes the church's authority over her discipline, that you can, uh, that one pope can't bind another pope a, a farther down the line on disciplinary issues, on canonical issues. Because that's one of your biggest arguments in favor of quo primum and in favor of not being able to change the liturgy after this um, Pope Pius V bull, quo primum. They say that any changes to this are invalid. That's something you hear commonly bandied about. And of course, the proper response is on disciplinary matters, such as the liturgy, the Pope has authority to change. What's bound at one level can be unbound at the same level. Except, obviously, doctrine, uh, dogma, things that are pronounced, that's bound at a higher level it, because it's truly the Holy Spirit binding. But this wasn't a universal act. Quo primum, for example, contemplates leaving around non-Latin rites that were over 200 years old. And it was changed by Pope Pius V himself and his immediate predecessor. And the confetior, uh, the rite of the confetior, was changed. And saints were added to the canon and all types of stuff. It, it's hilarious to me that the point is being made right now by an SSPX proponent that the SSPX, or I'm sorry, that a pope cannot bind a future pope. I would agree. But the fact is that a pope, if he is going to overrule another pope, has to actually overrule him. He has to actually issue some kind of a statement, a motu proprio, of equal or greater authority overruling the prior magisterial document. And that hasn't happened. All we have is Pope Francis hinting around, giving faculties to hear confession in the year of mercy, so that the people who were getting false absolution from charlatan priests who knew darn well they didn't have jurisdiction to absolve sins, would actually be able to absolve sins. And people weren't having troubled consciences and black consciences walking around because they hadn't been really getting the sacrament. They'd been getting a mockery of it. Um, so Pope Francis says himself why he allows SSPX to hear confessions. It has nothing to do with, oh, well, I guess the church came around. We were wrong. Vatican II was wrong. It was a farce. Um, and the SSPX was right. So we're going to go slowly walk back our position. There's none of that. He says, in the meantime, motivate 
motivated by the need to respond to the good of these faithful through my own disposition, I establish those who, during the holy year of mercy, approach these priests of the fraternity of St. Pius X to celebrate the sacrament of reconciliation shall validly and licitly, licitly receive absolution of their sins. He's saying it's an act of mercy. It's not for the SSPX, it's for the faithful that have been hoodwinked into them and who they didn't tell. I mean, I, I stand aghast at the, the, I guess, the perfidy of these priests who are going through the rigmarole of presuming to pretend to hear confessions when they don't have jurisdiction to hear it. That's, that's a ghastly thing. Um, but so he didn't want that to happen anymore. I, I guess who can blame him in that regard? So he allowed them to have power to remit sins. And that's what he can do as the pope. He's the pope. He's the head of the church. He's the vicar of Christ. He's Christ's prime minister. He's been given the keys to the kingdom, which is also why you need to obey him and why you can't separate from him, because you have a different misconception of what Vatican II actually said, when, of course, it's not filet that has the, the authority to interpret a council or conciliar documents. It's not um, Lefebvre that has that authority. As Pope Paul VI said when he rebuked Lefebvre a decade before John Paul II, that prerogative belongs to Rome. So on, in regards to Pope Francis allowing marriages to take place, this is very much, by the way, in line in keeping with the overarching theme of the Francis pontificate, which I would say is kind of mercy at the expense of justice. Um, I don't think, again, it's a good idea to give people faculties and more recognition than they actually deserve to be able to confer sacraments and kind of play house, play like you're making nice with people who are in an ejective state of heresy. It's heresy to say, I don't accept Vatican II. You have to. Uh, you have to accept an ecumenical council of the church. You're not allowed to just say, well, I'm going to go ahead and look at the prior church teaching and a judge on my own, take it upon myself as an individual bishop to judge the Pope in communion with the College of Bishops, or as an individual, God forbid, to judge the Pope in communion with the College of Bishops. You can't do that. And that's what Arius did. Everybody thinks like all of these bad actors in church history, like Arius and Nestorius, who have ushered in these wicked and harmful heresies. They think they were sitting around like twisting their beard, trying to get the church in some Luciferian scheme. They weren't. Arius was trying to uphold the, the doctrine of the unity of God, of the oneness of God. And he did it at the expense of the son and started engaging in this subordinationism, saying that the son was somehow less than the father and not of the same substance as the father. But he was doing that for a good reason. He wanted to uphold the unity of God, just like the SSPX is rejecting the Second Vatican Council because they want to uphold, supposedly, tradition. But you, there's no way, as the Vatican has said to the SSPX, to cleave from the church and to judge the church and uphold tradition. No one judges Rome. It's an old adage, and it's there for good reason. So, but it's foolish to have granted these mercies and these faculties to the SSPX but again, with marriage, Pope Francis wanted to do that. That way people had valid marriages and they weren't living in sin. Because if you don't have a church marriage, you're living in sin. And if those faculties aren't granted by the church to witness a marriage, then you can't do it. There's a so lot to unpack there, married, uh, David. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, sorry. I'm... I'm Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. No, no, no problem. Uh, so we went a little bit over time. I'll, I'll, I'll give that amount of time to you as well, Jeff. I think what we'll do is, Jeff, you'll have about six minutes to respond uh, to whatever you can from that segment. And then we will cut to a little two-minute uh, shameless commercial for RTF while you gentlemen prepare your final remarks. Uh, so after the commercial break, then uh, David will prepare uh, and deliver his 10-minute uh, final remarks, and then the same to you, uh, Jeff. So five minutes to you, Jeff. Now, you heard a lot, by the way, just now, and and the the, the final sort of thing that, um, that David has now brought up a couple times is the Second Vatican Council and whether or not it is uh, schismatic to reject some portions of it. 
Uh, so hopefully that is addressed either in this coming five minutes or your final 10 minutes. But Jeff, uh, over to you, sir. Thank you, Mike. So clarifying this question about papal authority, uh, certainly popes can bind subsequent popes when we're talking about uh, dogma. So when a, a pope declares that, uh, you know, Mary was assumed into heaven or the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady or the Trinity or whatever it might be, then, then of course the popes are acting in concert with their divine uh, authority. But when a, a pope says, for example, that priests, uh, you know, that married men can't be ordained to the priesthood or that priests can't be married or that we have to uh, abstain from meat on Friday, these are all things that reside within his unlimited authority to bind and loose. These are discipline. These are canonical things. But what we're talking about here, we're not talking about dogma. We're talking about disciplines and, and canon law. So if a pope says, oh, you broke a canon law, and then a subsequent pope says, I'm not worried about that anymore, and I'm lifting the, the penalty that had been there for that crime, it, it, it no longer exists. It's no longer part of our reality. The fact that it happened in the past is is a memory that's written down on a piece of paper. It's not binding anymore. So we're back to one of the three errors that I outlined at the beginning here, David's insistence on ignoring what the current pope has done to go back and cite, uh, in this case, a dead pope, uh, which is completely irrelevant at this point. Now, Vatican I explained the limits of papal authority. It's not to create new dogmas. It's very explicit. The pope is a protector of the deposit of the faith. So if we want to have a conversation about Vatican II, and I don't think we have time for that. And we want to explore this question of, of heresy. I'd love to know what heresy the SSPX is guilty of, because no pope has ever accused them of heresy. And where did Vatican II say that nothing in its pastoral documents could ever be questioned by a Catholic? You know, there's a problem with that, of that argument, David, and that's canon law, which says that you and I have the right under canon law to question our pastors. So, if, if someone proposes something that seems to be contrary to the faith, and you're telling me I can't question it, even though canon law says I can question my pastors, then how would we ever resolve anything? What council in the history of the church didn't have people asking questions of it? So this, this desire to uh, uh, elevate Vatican II beyond the status that even the popes and the fathers of the council assigned to it uh, this reeks of, of an ultramontanism that was rejected by Vatican I, that a pope can just create new doctrines at will and that they're going to be binding on people. In fact, Vatican I explicitly condemned that theory. And, and I suspect that, that you know that. So here's where that gets us. What were the new doctrines that were taught by Vatican II? Why are they above questioning if there are new dogmas? And how would you reconcile that kind of thinking with the fact that Paul VI said himself, quote, in view of the pastoral nature of the council, it avoided any extraordinary statement of dogmas that would be endowed with the note of infallibility. In 2016, Archbishop Pozo, talking about the differences between the society and the Vatican, said that those differences did not involve doctrine. He, he says, here's the quote, Certain documents are indeed binding upon Catholics for them to affirm and to accept, such as the teaching on the sacramentality of the Episcopal office, the consecration as the fullness of holy orders, and he gives a long list of dogmas, none of which have ever been uh, questioned by the SSPX. But then he says, but with regard to the earlier mentioned documents, Nostra Aetate, and he gives Unitatis Gratio, uh, uh, Declaration Dignitatis Humanae and Religious Liberty, Pozo says, thank you, Mike, they are not about doctrines or definitive statements, but rather about instructions and orienting guides for pastoral practice, practice like discipline. Thus, the society can continue to discuss these pastoral aspects after uh, the proposed canonical approval in order to lead us to further and clarifications. Now, this is all consistent if you have the proper understanding of the way that the church works. If you don't assign to yourself the ability to excommunicate other people or to, to declare other people to be in schism. Now, I could read you dozens of such quotes from canon lawyers, from cardinals, and from the popes themselves. Cardinal Walter Brandmuller, who we know was a very close friend of uh, Pope Benedict, says that Nostra Aetate and Dignitatis Humanae, some of the documents in which small parts have been questioned by the society, 
do not have a binding doctrinal content so one can dialogue about them. Now, I have searched high and low. I cannot find anywhere where a pope has said that the SSPX is guilty of heresy. And I would love in the next segment to hear what those heresies are. I'm reposting right now the format of the debate. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for your comments. Um, and we're going to change the format of the debate a little bit just because I really have not seen substantive comments from the chat. The chat's been very active, uh, Jeff and David, and I'm sure when you go back and read it, uh, you will you will be chagrinning at what you see. Some of it is productive. Very uh, a lot of it is not. What we'll do now is we will go into a, a bit of a two minute commercial break, uh, so that you can both prepare your uh, your closing statements. You'll have ten minutes for your closing statements, um, and so here we go. All right, and we're back. Uh, Jeff and Dave are taking a quick bio break right now. Uh, so they've asked for additional time. What I would like to do uh, is maybe just take a minute and, and filter some of your questions. And I know that they can hear me right now, so I'm going to ask these questions aloud as the two are preparing their remarks. Um, so I'm seeing a question in the chat about Vatican II. The question is, what was definitively defined, if anything, defide at Vatican II? So how is it possible to uh, be in schism from uh, a council that does not actually define anything uh, using the anathema? So I'm seeing that question. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm going through some other questions here. As the men prepare their final comments, I want to make sure that everybody is pleased. Yeah, throw that in, and you can d definitely answer that, um, Dave, in, in your next segment. Please do. Uh, another question for Dave. Is Archbishop Vigano in schism for saying that Vatican II should be thrown out? And this questioner is obviously asking, is he guilty of the crime of schism, uh, as you've made the distinction between the crime and the punishment? Um, that, that It'd be great if you could touch on that in your, in your final remarks as well.
I will note, Dave, uh, I'll give you 10 more seconds of prep. While you're prepping, you should know that your sister-in-law is here, and she's, uh, she's defending you in the chat quite vigorously, I should say. That's nice of, nice of her to be here. Okay. Take it. There's so many points raised. I wish we could have had a little bit more actually back and forth in retrospect, and maybe we could do that at some point, because I think a lot of this has gotten lost in the noise of some of these arguments. You know, we're making kind of complex arguments, although I've tried to filter and distill what really matters here. Um, let me make sure my mic's on. Uh, I, I've been trying to distill it down to what really matters. And yeah, we... Uh, we're talking about the Second Vatican Council. Where does it say it can't be questioned? Well, no one said it can't be questioned, but questioning is different from dissenting. What we have here is there, there's questioning which errs on the side of faith. It's a hermeneutic of faith. A dissent is a hermeneutic of doubt. Now, as St. Augustine says about unpacking the mysteries of Scripture, sometimes Scripture seems to contradict itself. And he talks about this in De Doctrina Christiana. When scripture looks like it contradicts itself, the exegete doesn't say, well, that's it. I quit scripture. Obviously, it's not divinely inspired. That would be wrong. That would be foolhardy. Um, because we have finite intellects. And the Holy Spirit operates an infinite level, infinitely above us. So that being the case, God gives us some of these things to mull over and to contemplate, St. Augustine says, as an act of mercy, so that it increases our faith and it increases our ardor for him. Because in contemplating the divine mysteries and working out how certain things that appear to be difficulties, or at least in tension with one another, by working that out, you are engaging in an exercise of trust, number one, but you're also getting the wheels churning, the, the theological wheels. And then when you come to an answer and you do thread the needle on a difficult question, there is a certain glory in just passing that on. So it increases our fervor for evangelization. That's what St. Augustine says. Now, there's a lot of things in Scripture that seem like they might contradict one another. There's two creation stories right in the outset in the first three chapters of Genesis. People aren't walking away from the church over, over that. They understand they're to take this in a hermeneutic of trust. And if you are a faithful exegete, you can work out some of the apparent, some of the uh, kind of titular tension that's there. This is why Canon 752 of Canon Law tells us, although not an assent of faith, a religious submission of the intellect and will must be given to a doctrine which the Supreme Pontiff or the College of Bishops declares concerning faith or morals when they exercise the authentic magisterium, even if they do not intend to proclaim it by definitive act. Therefore, the Christian faithful are to take care to avoid those things which they do, which they do not agree with it. I, okay, so, and that's Lumen Gentium 25 also. We are, when they're, the church engages in an authentic act of the magisterium, we are to give an assent of mind and will to that authentic act. And that doesn't just attach, as we saw in Canon 752, to something that's proclaimed de fide with an anathema attached to it. Certainly, Vatican II, it's an ecumenical council. It demands the submission of intellect and will. And it's certainly doctrinal. People hear this and they hear, oh, it was a pastoral council, so therefore it didn't further doctrine. No, the reason it was called was primarily pastoral, to address the encroachment of modernism in the 20th century. The church saw that there were these forces of secularism, and it had to come up with a way for us to dialogue more effectively with the world to convert the world. That's why Vatican II existed. It wasn't to embrace modernism, it was to fight modernism. Now, I'll grant that partly the forces of modernism came in and tried to hijack the council. You had your Rahners and your Kungs and your Skillebecks, um, and, and they were a force there. But they weren't enough to destroy the end product, even though they could hide some ambiguities in the, the wording of the council. They didn't undermine it fully. They didn't destroy it. 
They just kind of hamstrung it in some regards. And there, there's some wording which can be overcome if you understand it in the hermeneutic of continuity as opposed to a hermeneutic of rupture, which, of course, Benedict XVI devoted his pontificate to teaching us. So it's part of the magisterium, it's part of Pope Benedict XVI's magisterium, that we have to understand Vatican II in a hermeneutic of continuity with the Church's prior teachings. And it can be assumed into the deposit of faith without contradiction. That's the Pope talking. That's not me talking, that's not an apologist talking, that's the Pope. Yet the SSPX presumes to discard it. It presumes to say that Sacrosanctum Concilium and the new uh, liturgy that came out of Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Novus Ordo, is sinful to attend, and the faithful do not have an obligation to attend it. That, Jeff, is heresy, and that's actually against the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent attaches, I believe, an anathema, um, and I'm trying to find the reference to it. That's what I was trying to do when we came over uh, from the break. Um, it attaches an anathema to anyone who says that the church, by her liturgy, by what she changes in her liturgy, is scandalizing people. So you're actually in heresy when you reject the new mass because that cuts against the, ca uh, the Council of Trent. So that's a Protestant trick. And obviously the Protestants thought that they were doing a good thing, too, in clearing all the accretions off the bark of Peter. They thought that they were getting back to the earlier faith, just like Arius thought he was getting back to the earlier faith. But whenever you break with Rome, you are in error. And we have that. You re reference um, Pastor Eternus, but... We have Pastor Eternus, chapter 2, section 3. Whoever succeeds to the chair of Peter obtains by the institution of Christ himself the primacy of Peter over the whole church. So what the truth has ordained stands firm, and blessed Peter perseveres in the rock-like strength he was granted and does not abandon the guidance of the church which he once received. Uh, for this reason, it has always been necessary for every church, that is to say the faithful throughout the world, to be in agreement with the Roman church because of its preeminent authority in consequence of being joined as members to head with that sea from which the rites of sacred communion flow to all. They will grow together into the structure of a single body. Um, it's very much the, the truth of the church is that Rome has authority. And when you separate yourself from the authority, you put yourself in at risk of eternal damnation. And that's why I'm speaking to the SSPX sympathizers out there today. You are at risk of eternal damnation. You are following people who call the Novus Ordo that was brought in by Sacrosanctum Concilium, one of the four constitutions of the new um, of, of Vatican II, which is the first constitution, actually, because since liturgy is the privileged place of evangelization, the church teaches, they thought that to dialogue with the modern world, to evangelize the modern world, the liturgy would be the first place to go. Just like Pius XII was trying to usher in reforms in Mediator Day so that the liturgy could form the modern world. It wasn't so that the world could form the liturgy. Um, yeah, so you, you're disputing the Pope and his authority to alter the discipline, to the disciplinary aspects of the liturgy, the lex orandi of the liturgy. Now, you can't alter certain components of liturgy. They couldn't take away the words of consecration. They couldn't say that the gospel reading is not necessary because these are necessary components. But they do have the power to change the accidents of liturgy. And you've seen this happen throughout the ages. Do you know why we pray the Kyrie eleison? That's not Latin, that's Greek. Because the earliest liturgy was in Greek. And the church had the authority to change that liturgy. The first liturgies were in Greek and they lasted to the third century. So, yes, when it, it's very much a heresy, Jeff. When the SSPX says on their website that it's sinful to attend the new mass. It all around and that you should miss the new mass and you shouldn't go and you can't discharge your Sunday obligation there. So that's that's one issue. Um, where did. So canon law so says we have a right and a duty to question the church. That's correct. But the church also says how it ought to be questioned how you should raise these issues. And the way that Lefebvre has raised these issues is precisely the wrong way. You do it as a faithful son within the church. You don't go three minutes. 
Okay. You don't go without the church to change it. You do it within the church. And that's why, you know why unfettered illegal immigration is bad, not for just America, but for Latin America? It's because when people are able to leave and find refuge someplace else, they don't stay and deal with the problems in their institution. We need the SSPXers. We need their vigor and their verve and their zealous spirit for the truth to stay in the church, to fight the corruption in the church. If people can just leave and break off to another institution that suits their fancy whenever they're upset about something, then you're actually leaving the people who have the power to make a change. The, the people who, are having, who have a power to make the change are leaving, and therefore they're not instituting changes in their original institution. So we have a right and a duty to question the church in certain sense, in that we make known our, con our concerns to our bishops. But we do it in a sp spirit of filial reverence and trust. And ultimately, we know that the magisterium has the authority to bind. And we have to ultimately defer to the magisterium even when we don't understand something. In the wake of every ecumenical council throughout history, it took hundreds of years, really, for the weight and gravity of the council's teachings to set in. There was, it wasn't just the Council of Nicaea and then Arianism was done. It took hundreds of years to work this all out. Hundreds of years after each council. And we're seeing that in Vatican II. But now we have people leaving the church because of what they see in their limited, non-binding uh, capacity as members of the laity or individual bishops as irreconcilable problems. But there aren't irreconcilable problems. You are in error. Rome is not in error. And that's one of the things that's taught at Vatican I, the indefectibility of the church. If there it seems to be a problem, it's not the church who has gone astray. It's you who have gone astray. Um, it, now, these last questions, hopefully I'll just do them real fast. Is Vigano in schism? No, because there's not a disobedient act that's attached to that. He might be raising these things just the way we hear it in canon law, that the faithful have a right and a duty to make known their concerns to their pastors, to the bishops. So by raising this issue, but keeping in a hermeneutic of trust where he's not left the church, he's not broken off, he's not ordaining priests, he has not become a schismatic as yet. But I would say that I think it's it's getting close to the point where the questioning is out of line. It, it, Vatican II is an ecumenical council. The Holy Spirit was at work. It will be subsumed faithfully into the corpus of the deposit of faith. And it takes time to work out exactly how. That's what theologians are for. And that's what the magisterium is for. And we will see clarity and light from that. Um, so, yeah, that's. Uh, sorry, I, I was looking at the, the bubble that popped up on the screen. Um, so I think that. Archbishop Vigano should kind of slow his role. I absolutely do. Um, and just because, well, I, I'm out of time. I, I'd love to go on. The, my point, I guess the whole thing, the issue is schism is an act of disobedience predicated on a doctrinal error. SSPX is in schism. It's There have been the illicit consecrations. Every mass they say is an illicit mass. It's a valid mass, which is why you're, the faithful are able to discharge Sunday obligation there. But it's an illicit mass. Every new mass is an act of disobedience to the church. Um, so, and they they are in doctrinal error. They reject the Second Vatican Council. They reject Sacrosanctum Concilium. They have said the church itself against indefectibility has fallen into heresy. So they're, in a way, rejecting tacitly this doctrine of indefectibility. And because of that, they are in schism, they're in disobedience, and they must be avoided by the faithful. Do not accept their errors. Come back to Holy Mother Church and help us purify her of her corruption. Don't abandon her to find an institution that suits your fancy. David Gordon, uh, an impassionate final uh, statement from you. Thank you so much for that. Jeff, you heard a lot. I want to throw in a couple of the questions from the live chat as well to pile on to what uh, David has raised. David is talking a lot about 
uh, Vatican II, the indefectibility of the church, the Novus Ordo Mass specifically. Stephanie Gordon asks on the live chat, isn't Vatican II binding even, isn't it, isn't it authoritative even if it doesn't define new dogma or anathematize anything? Uh, others on the chat have asked uh, c- questions from a, a differing point of view. Is, the, is Abu Dhabi in line with Vatican II? Is the Pachamama in line with with Vatican II. So, uh, one person asked if you could comment on why uh, Archbishop Lefebvre did, in fact, participate in Vatican II and appear to sign off on uh, some of the documents. A lot of this has to do with Vatican II. That's what this is boiling down to, it seems like, in this debate. Um, that's certainly where David left off. I hope you can pick up the ball there and answer some of those questions in your final segment, sir. Thank you, Mike, and again, thank you for hosting this debate, and and David, I appreciate uh, your vigorous uh, defense of your position. I think it's very important that we uh, leverage this technology and the ability to reach people like this. Regarding the question about uh, Archbishop Lefebvre signing off on Vatican, uh, the documents of Vatican II, it is my understanding that he was there, that he signed off on most of them, maybe all of them, and that he later began to see how they were being implemented back home in the diocese or across Europe, in Africa, where, of course, he had such a, a prolific career, and that they could no longer be understood uh, according to that, that traditional way in which he had probably assumed they would be. That's my understanding. Now, uh, <clears throat> Stephanie's question about Vatican II being authoritative, well, of course, uh, there are different levels of authority within the Church, and the ability of the Pope or an ecumenical council to bind our Uh, allegiance to those teachings varies based on what it is. If it's divine law, then it's explicit. And to the extent that Vatican II reaffirmed dogmas that had always been taught by the Church, uh, reaffirmed dogmas that were part of the deposit of the faith, then of course we're bound to uh, obey those. But if they teach novelties, then in fact we're we're bound to, uh, not just a question that, that, but if they uh, attach to dogmas, novelties about dogmas, then we're actually bound uh, to question that. Now, I warned the audience at the very outset that David would build his arguments based on three errors, talking about people who lacked authority to make declarations of schism and excommunication, uh, referring to people whose declarations were in direct opposition to uh, public reading of canon law, which, which you can get on the internet for free, uh, or or making citations of people whose uh, a very opinions have already been reversed by a higher authority uh, or by their successor. Now, it's, it's the Feast of St. Jerome today, and I, I thought it was relevant to cite this uh, quote from St. Jerome. Uh, he says that not every disobedience is a schism. In order to possess a schismatic character, he says, it must include, besides the transgression of the command of the superior, a denial of their divine right to command. Now, even David will not accuse the society of denying the institution of the papacy. Nowhere has he said that the SSPX denies that the Pope is the vicar of Christ or that he has the authority to bind and loose. Now, we've seen in this debate today that the excommunications were objectively invalid. And even if you believe they were valid, you must acknowledge that they were lifted by Pope Benedict. We've seen that the Vatican has said repeatedly that the SSPX is not in schism, both in her words and in her actions regarding the SSPX. We've seen that the highest authority in the church has repeatedly said they're Catholic. Pope Francis has given them a canonical ministry by by identifying Bishop Filet as a minister of first instance and a minister of second instance as an appellate court for the priests of the SSPX. They can't possibly be within the canonical governance of Rome and not be in communion with Rome. They have faculties to hear confessions. They have the right to ordain priests and discipline priests. And their marriages are supposed to be presumed valid based on what the Pope has told the bishops. Now, the opinions of laymen and bishops and cardinals from previous decades, those are irrelevant. The canonical rulings of previous popes that have been reversed, they are irrelevant. We cannot claim as Catholics that JP2 was owed obedience in 1988, but that Pope Francis is not owed obedience in 2020. This is not a Catholic claim. So when Vatican II reaffirms dogmas from previous centuries, we owe our obedience. When in her pastoral documents she teaches novelty, we are not only free to dissent, we may even be obliged. How could this possibly be so? Is this in any way 
reconcilable with the Catholic faith? Well, it's almost as if the Holy Spirit was guiding St. Paul when in Galatians 1.8, he said, even if an angel were to teach a different doctrine, we should disobey. Now, Vatican I expressly condemned the idea that pope could, popes could teach new dogmas that were not found in the deposit of faith. So people who have taken Vatican II and elevated it beyond what even the popes who called it and the popes who reigned and closed it, that Vatican II is above question, that everything must be submitted to beyond religious submission, but with that faith of dogma, this itself is a heresy. Now, by the way, it seems appropriate at this point to say, I'm in good standing in the Diocese of Nashville. You could reach out to Bishop Mark Spaulding and ask him. I'm sure he'd be willing to, happy to hear from you. Now, the notion to me that in 2020, we have to have this conversation about schism and heresy after so many prelates and a pope have answered explicitly in the negative. It really gets to, to the heart of the crisis in the church for me. It's a combination of poor catechesis laced with a toxic dose of pride. Now, a wise Southern old mayor once told me that arrogance and ignorance were a lethal combination. And I think we're seeing that now with the enemies of tradition and the enemies of the SSPX in particular. The people who are making these accusations, they lack the authority to make these pronouncements. They lack the formation in canon law to speak credibly. And in some cases, they've even been censured by their own bishops, told they cannot use the word Catholic, including the organization that David works for. And yet they want to threaten the rest of us with excommunication and schism. But worse than that, they are openly rejecting the authority of the Holy Father while accusing others of being guilty of that same crime. Now, for those of you at home, and, and David, for you, I must say, the faithful don't need canonical Karens running loose around the world. The church has a juridical system. She has a system of tribunals. She has a court of appeals. And they don't involve David Gordon, Tim Gordon, or Michael Voris, or for that matter, any other layman who doesn't like the SSPX. Now, I know these are tough words, but I share them in authentic charity. As the saints teach us, there are obstacles to our sanctity. The first is ourselves. The second is the temptation of the world. And the third is Satan. Your personal dislike for the SSPX must be subordinated to your love and respect for the vic vicar of Christ. Even if you still think you're right after all the Holy Father has done, you should in prudence recognize that your public dissent sows further confusion among the faithful at a time when there's already a mass apostasy. It's a rejection of dogma by overwhelming numbers of Catholics and a loss of faith which perhaps just coincidentally became after the council and advances even faster today. Your path to heaven, the same as mine, will come through fulfilling your duties according to your state in life as a husband and father, through your prayer, your prayer and fasting, through your joyful embrace of the many crosses I have no doubt you're bearing. It will not come through attacking fellow Catholics, no matter how well-intentioned you are. Now, you have no ecclesial credentials, no church-approved ministry. You're working extra ecclesia outside the church, and perhaps you believe that God has anointed you as a prophet for our times to, to save faithful Catholics from the evil of Archbishop Lefebvre and the society he founded. Your comments from today and your monologue of September 7th tend in that direction. But prophets appointed by God usually prove the legitimacy of their divine mission through the miracles they work, as Elijah did when he called down fire from heaven, or as St. Paul did. Now, David, you've done an admirable job here. You're well-researched. You're very vigorous in your presentation. But all of this is the work of your own hands, the work of man. So how are we to reconcile this guarantee for the church that we find the indefectibility that Christ promised to work through the vicar of Christ until all time if we have to accept your notion that only JP2 could rule the church and his successors suddenly lack the same power to bind and loose? Now, in contrast, I would offer you to this. The fruits of Archbishop Lefebvre and the society he founded are evidence of the divine approval. In 50 years, they've ordained a thousand men, established missions in 70 countries, and that would make them one of the most fruitful priestly societies in the entire history of the church. All this came despite fierce resistance, not just from the world, but many in the church, while at the same time, the church had a 90% loss of vocations and an infiltration at every level by sodomites, heretics, and masons. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I hope this debate has brought clarity and peace where confusion and anxiety have earlier reigned. 
In this country alone, many thousands of people have ref been refused the sacraments by their priests and their bishops. Where the diocesan bishops and churches shut them down and cut the faithful off from the sacraments, the society has received them with joy and mercy. Surely our Lord foresaw these dark days and brought about the canonical developments of recent years, admittedly through the unlikely human agent of Pope Francis, and to use his words so that there would, quote, be no more uncertainty. No competent living authority has ever declared the SSPX to be in schism or in heresy. By her silence over these last 32 years, Rome has spoken. The matter is settled. St. Jerome, pray for us. Pope St. Pius X, pray for us. Our Lady of Sorrows, pray for us. We should do a follow-up to this, and I should also learn how to turn my microphone on. But I couldn't be more grateful uh, to you gentlemen, Jeff and Dave, for coming on uh, the channel and having this important discussion. I wish that we had more time. I think we should do this again, maybe consider doing a part two. I would also implore, I think there are a lot of other folks out there who like these formats and like these debates, and we should have more of them um, because it, you know people have to make up their minds about these important uh, decisions and distinctions. One thing I hope we can all agree on, well, regardless of where you fall on this issue, if you if you are with Dave Gordon or if you're with Jeff Kassman, we we all owe collectively owe a debt of gratitude to Archbishop Lefebvre for the continuation and the existence of the traditional Latin Mass, which very well could have been extinguished but for what he did. Um, other than that, I, gentlemen, I, I'm going to sign off, and I, I really appreciate you doing this God bless you, and please, if you watch this and you liked it, subscribe to the channel and, uh, and do all those things. Good night, everybody.